is another adrenal mass. This one is a little more heterogeneous. You can see mixed hypodensity, hyperdensity within it. And there's quite a bit of stranding that's pretty hyperdense, looks for all the world like hemorrhage. And those are the classic characteristics of the pheochromocytoma. Uh, these masses have a tendency to necrose and to hemorrhage. And that is exactly how this one presented. So you can see the mass separate from a large acute hematoma that's developing there. Again, uh, clearly hyperdense fluid collection. And we'll look at that heterogeneity within the mass itself one more time here. This one too was non-secretory. Catecholamines were uh, normal. So uh, we actually had to wait for a while to know that we were right. Our radiologist, this was uh, Jim Sloves. Way to go, Jim. Uh, he called it appropriately as a pheochromocytoma, uh, but the catecholamines were negative. We thought we were wrong for a little while, uh, but ultimately the path proved it correct. Right. There is uh, definitely, a, I think it's the 10% tumor, right, that uh, are not functional. So that one is a pheochromocytoma, again, a tendency to necrosis and hemorrhage. Okay, well, we already saw a renal cell carcinoma invading the renal vein. So I thought uh, for this one, we couldn't go back there. But this is a wild one for you. Uh, this is a renal transplant patient, and you can see this transplant is unusual. It's a cross-fused ectopia transplant. It's two kidneys stuck together, obviously a cadaveric transplant since that uh, donor patient was left with nothing. Uh, and kind of unusual, I thought. It just shows uh, they're getting a little more loose with the rules in terms of uh, transplants because in my day, boy, you never considered uh, transplanting an organ that had the slightest abnormality in it, right? And here they've gone and taken a cross-fused ectopia transplant. Uh, so pretty impressive. Farther down, though, you can see as a result probably, or at least a contributory, was the immunosuppression. So now we've got a hypodense mass, but also, look at that, a renal vein filling defect extending up from the hilum of the kidney. So this is a renal cell carcinoma with renal inv vein invasion arising in a cross-fused ectopia transplant. So you can see polycystic kidneys. There's the cross-fused ectopia transplant, and there is that renal vein filling defect coming up from that renal mass. Pretty unfortunate patient. There again, the polycystic kidneys necessitating this transplant. And there is the venous invasion from that renal mass. So that is a renal cell carcinoma arising in a transplanted cross-fused ectopia kidney with renal vein invasion. Woof. All right, uh, benign tumors at least, but these are fatty masses basically replacing both kidneys. There's quite a bit of perinephric density consistent with hemorrhage. And of course, these do present frequently with hemorrhage. There's a lot of that perinephric density inferiorly here, and you can see layering density, again, suggesting that that's hemorrhage. So angiomyolipomas certainly are known for hemorrhage. Uh, you'll not see them this extensive very often, but pretty impressive. Of course, these are associated with tuberous sclerosis, but they can uh, occur uh, of their own accord, usually in middle-aged females, which was the case here. So those are hemorrhagic angiomyolipomas. Oh, this is a good one. Caught this one earlier than you will typically see them. So I've always uh, found this one pretty interesting. This one actually resulted from, uh, I like to tell the story about our teaching file, that we have a file where radiologists can drop uh, their various cases of interest into a file where we can then all contribute and uh, can save these and can uh, help to run them down and get the clinical follow-up, you know, the uh, outcomes, the path, and what have you. 
Uh, so I sat down one day looking at my collection. I thought, my carcinoid is old and sorry. So I sat down at that teaching file and I typed in metastatic carcinoid tumor. And that thing gave me 73 cases of metastatic carcinoid tumor. I, I spent a week going through them all. Uh, but I was truly amazed. There are uh, over 45,000 cases in that teaching file now. It's been present for almost 10 years, I think nine years at this point. So pretty cool. But this is the one that stood out amongst all the 73 carcinoids. Uh, it's got some pretty neat features. So here is the mesenteric mass. That is the MET that has developed from the initial small bowel tumor. And you can see the, the stranding, the spiculation extending out from it just feels like that thing is cicatricial, doesn't it? Like it's pulling things in like a black star, a black hole, sorry. So there are also dilated small bowel loops adjacent, suggesting there's going to be an element of obstruction when we go to a lower cut. And here it is. There's wall thickening right there and a little enhancement. You can see there's a hyperdense mass right there at the caliber transition of the small bowel. So this is how they actually start. They start as a small bowel tumor. They metastasize up into the mesentery that forms all that cicatricial mess, right? But this one, and, and typically then will calcify in the mesentery. But this one presented earlier, probably because the primary tumor caused enough obstruction to bring this patient to clinical attention. So there's this cicatricial mass in the mesentery right there. You see all those dilated loops of small bowel, right? And there's the caliber transition with the obstructing mass. Again, non-calcified mass, but you can still see all that cicatrization. And there is where it all began, right? Caliber transition enhancing soft tissue mass. Let's look at that one more time. Again, it's unusual because these usually progress more, right? You don't see them present with small bowel obstruction, and typically those mesenteric masses are far more prominent and typically calcified. All right, so that's a metastatic carcinoid tumor. Next one is another intussusception but this one more readily diagnosable, there's a fat density intraluminal mass, right? And here you can see tubular filling defects coming up through the lumen of the colon. And there are actually two of them there. And you'll see at the end, one is a dilated appendix and the other is a dilated loop of small bowel. And both have into susceptible up into the proximal colon because it basically is an ileocecal into susception. So look for those when we watch this movie. Right? We'll see two tubular filling defects within the colon lumen uh, resolve into an appendix and a dilated small bowel. So here they come, appendix and small bowel. So there is the fatty mass, the lipoma acting as a lead point, and then there are both the small bowel and the appendix which were dragged up into the colonic lumen. So that is a classic lipoma acting as a lead point for an intussusception. The other situation where you might see an adult intussusception. All right. I know for a fact I forgot to uh, move this into susception case, so we're just going to click through it, right? This is the one we saw earlier. That's the beautiful view right there. Might as well look at it one more time. That is the adenocarcinoma with into susception. All right, this is a doozy. So look at all these hypodense masses throughout the entirety of the abdomen, but look particularly at what they do to the contour of the organs they're up against. This is the most noteworthy portion right here, scalloped appearance. Looks like someone's been taking bites out of the liver. 
right? And that is the classic appearance of this entity. Now, the thing that really is helpful here to tell you about where it all came from is the fact that there's been a colectomy. There's a staple line right there. So this all comes together very nicely, right? This is a colon carcinoma recurrence and pseudomyxoma peritonei. And these uh, cause that scalloping. Look at the liver contour. It's just really striking. Of course, the spleen is no different. That is a classic appearance of pseudomyxoma peritonei. And then there's that staple line telling you what the obvious source of this was. But let's look at that liver and spleen one more time. That contour is unmistakable. All right, you don't see that every day. I can tell you, I, I think I've only seen that in the course of practice maybe twice in my life. It's really pretty unusual. Certainly, you can see omental mets and all kinds of solid masses, but these truly myxomatous uh, secretory implants uh, that cause this kind of scalloping to the, the visci, that's pretty unusual. All right, here is a classic featureless ahaustral colon with a little mucosal enhancement. You'll see uh, the entire colon is involved, and it's pretty classic uh, ulcerative colitis. But there's this one segment where there's thickening of the wall, enhancement, and clear luminal narrowing, in fact, causing a, a pretty significant degree of obstruction. So this is the classic comp complication of ulcerative colitis, right? They have a much higher incidence of colon carcinoma and are supposed to get yearly uh, colonoscopic surveillance as a result. And you can see that ahaustral rectum as well. You can see the dilation of the proximal colon and relative decompression of the distal. And there is that enhancing segment, so typical of a secondary carcinoma. Let's look at that one more time. That is a beauty. All right, so that is an ulcerative colitis with the uh, classic secondary carcinoma. Those can, I will say those can be tough. Uh, you can get strictures with ulcerative colitis as well. They will look a lot like that. They might enhance a little bit. Uh, they can have that luminal narrowing and even uh, some level of obstruction, but that one is just thicker and more dense than any such stricture I've ever seen. I think you can pretty confidently say that that one's a carcinoma. All right, the retroperitoneal liposarc. These are sad. They're so slow growing and uh, the lipomatous aspect of it so soft that these can get just enormous and shift everything around in the abdomen before they come to clinical attention. But the important things are, uh, you can see it's probably coming from the right retroperitoneum because of that anterior displacement of the kidney. Uh, you can also tell it's probably coming from the right because all of the abdominal organs are shoved over to the left. You can also tell that it's a liposarcoma because there's a, a clear soft tissue component there uh, one nodule being right there adjacent to that right kidney. There's a soft tissue mass as well in the pelvis. And again, you can see all of this that is fat is the retroperitoneal liposarcoma. And this remaining room is, uh, is where all of the abdominal organs have been relegated. So there's a little lung met as well. There's that displaced right kidney with the soft tissue nodule. And look at that displacement. All the intestines, the spleen, everything that can move has been shoved into the far left and inferior aspect of the peritoneum. And there again, a big soft tissue component down in the pelvis. 
All right, so that is a retroperitoneal liposarcoma. One of my favorites, uh, this is from my private practice days. My old buddy Scott gave me this one. He was my testicle guy, he gave me all kinds of great testicle cases. Uh, but this is a great one. So there is a pelvic mass. And then lower down, you can see there is no spermatic cord on the left. That, along with tracking the gonadal vein, are the things that lead you to this conclusion of what this is. So follow those gonadal vessels, they take you right to that mass and then there is nothing going past that right nothing out the inguinal canal no spermatic cord so that is an undescended testicle that was stuck in the pelvis and then the dread complication of course it turned into a seminoma uh, the the very reason we reposition these testicles So that's an undescended testicle with development of seminoma. All right, last one, not a mystery, but uh, I don't think you can have an instant diagnosis neoplasm presentation without one of these. And that is, of course, the ovarian dermoid. This has got it all, a soft tissue mass, but also a nice stripe of fat and some calcifications that on bone window you will see are actually teeth. So there's the mass with the fat and the calcification. You can see it pressing on the bladder there. And then there on the patient's left, you can see an upside down, clearly a molar, right, with a nice dense crown and a root there. So that is an ovarian dermoid with soft tissue, fat, and teeth. Pretty classic appearance. So a good way to end it. And that is it for instant diagnosis neoplasms.